So, uh, wait, wait. Yeah. Okay, Stuti. We are good to go. Yeah. yeah. So, good evening, everyone, and I welcome you all for uh, uh, one more exciting meeting, the 14th edition of uh, the ISPE SS program. And uh, the theme this uh, month is growth disorders. And uh, it's a two hour uh, uh, program. Uh, first hour, uh, it will be uh, uh, based on Turner syndrome uh, with a case, exciting case by Dr. Reshma, which will be moderated by Dr. Kavita Bhatt, madam. And uh, finally, we'll be hearing from Dr. Shanley uh, uh, about uh, the turn, uh, details about the Turner syndrome. Similarly, the second R is dedicated to growth hormone deficiency. A case will be presented by Dr. Uh, uh, Suraksha from Mumbai, will be, which will be moderated by Dr. IPS Kocher from Delhi. And finally, we'll be hearing from Professor Martin Savage uh, uh, directly from uh, London. And uh, with this, I would like to introduce Dr. Uh, Shaila Bhattacharya, madam. She is uh, she's a professor in the Department of Pediatrics, JJ MMC, Davangiri. She is a senior pediatric adolescent endocrinologist from Bangalore. She is uh, president of ISPE 2021-22 and convener of pediatric endocrinology fellowship here. She has authored uh, in uh, endocrine and pediatric textbooks and also published original articles, including case reports and review articles in the national and international index journals. I'll uh, pass it on to Dr. Shaila, madam, to uh, proceed further. Thank you, madam. Thank you, Dr. Hari. Uh, good evening, everybody. I think uh, we all uh, have heard Dr. Savage, Savage before, but it is very nice to have him here in our meeting. I warmly welcome Dr. Savage uh, from London and Dr. Shanley from Colorado. We would be very much delighted. I think uh, we have not had, heard about uh, Turners for a long time and also by Dr. Savage on uh, growth hormone. So it would be really nice uh, after two hours, we will be more and more uh, academically enriched after these uh, two special talks. Before that, uh, the two case presentations, one will be by Dr. Reshma, who will be uh, talking about uh, a case of Turner syndrome and the management. And Reshma is a postgraduate from the Department of Pediatrics. She is a second year pediatric postgraduate from Sri Ramchandra Institute of Higher Education and research from Chennai, which is in South India. And the mentors for this case are Dr. Kavita Bhatt and Dr. Divya Lakshmi. And, uh, Dr. Kavita Bhatt is my dear friend and colleague where we have been working together for last 25 years. She is uh, from KMC Bangalore, MBBS and MD from BMC Bangalore. Uh, she also, she did her fellowship in pediatric endocrinology and diabetes from States and she is currently working as senior consultant pediatric endocrinology at Simai Hospital, Bangalore. She is also the program director for Pediatric Endocrinology Fellowship Program in Astor Hospital, Bangalore. I also welcome Dr. Kocher, who is from Apollo Hospital, uh, Delhi, for this program. Over to you, Dr. Reshma and Dr. Kavita. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. You can share your slides. Good evening, all. Uh, I'm Dr. Reshma, MD Pediatrics Resident, second year from Ramchandra Medical College, Chennai. I'm presenting this case under uh, Dr. Divya Lakshmi, uh, Associate Professor, Consultant Pediatric Endocrinologist, Ramchandra, and Dr. Kavita. Uh, our child is a 10 years old female child, first born of non consanguineous marriage. She was brought to us with complaints of poor height and weight gain uh, in comparison to her peers from early childhood. Uh, this child has always been a thin and short child and has always been the shortest in her class. And she'd always uh, poorly outgrow her clothes, uh, that is her school uniforms, every year. There was no history of polyuria, polydipsia, no history of recurrent respiratory tract infections, no recurrent diarrhea suggestive of chronic illnesses, no history of constipation, cold intolerance, decline in scholastic performance. 
no history of headache nausea or vomiting uh, suggestive of raised icp no history of prolonged drug intake or no history of appearance of secondary sexual characters at presentation she was always a fussy eater and uh, eats only sp small portion sizes past history there was no history uh, significant past history birth history was uneventful antenatally the pregnancy was booked and immunized was uneventful she was a term uh, normal vaginal delivery birth weight was 2.7 kg Cry, child cried at birth postnatal neonatal period was uneventful uh, she was the first born of non consanguineous uh, parents she was a single child there was history of hypothyroidism in the mother and a history of short stature in the father and the paternal grandmother no history of diabetes hypertension dyslipidemia or uh, tuberculosis developmentally she was a normal uh, she was normal for her uh, age and uh, she was good at studies on general examination uh, she was alert active vitals were stable no pallor ictus cyanosis clubbing lymphadenopathy or pilarima on examination she had a webbed neck widely spaced widely spaced nipples low hairline multiple pigmented nevi on the back uh, pectus excavatum short fourth and fifth metacarpals and metatarsals there was no goiter anthropometry her height at presentation was 113 cm that was less than the third percentile her weight was 19.5 kg which is also less than the third percentile bmi was between the 25th to 50th percentile her father's height was 160 cm and mother, mother's height was 154 cm and the midparental height was 150.7 cm her um, target height was between 144.7 to 156.7 her uh, height at presentation was much lesser than the target height and the smr was prepubertal systemic examination was normal uh, a provisional diagnosis was a short stage for evaluation with the syndromic features our uh, diagnosis was probably turner syndrome investigation wise her counts were normal uh, thyroid function testing liver function and renal function testing was normal fsh and lh were elevated suggestive of hypergonadotropic hypogonadism lipid profile was normal ttg was negative her chronological age at presentation was 10 years and the bone age was 8.5 years echo was normal usg abdomen done showed infantile uterus with streak ovaries a uh, karyotype analyzed in 30 metaphases Uh, reveal loss of one X chromosome with karyotype being forty five X in uh, all cells, suggestive of Turner's. Uh, this child was started on uh, supplements uh, after diagnosis since two thousand nineteen. She has been receiving from the government hospital under the Tamil Nadu Chief Minister Health Insurance Scheme. Uh, growth hormone was started at the dose of point one units per kg per day. That is point two three milligram per kg per week. This child is currently thirteen years old. Her current height is one twenty nine point seven centimeters, and the weight is twenty eight point five kgs. Her growth velocity has been sixteen point five centimeters in the thirty two in last thirty two months, which was eight point five centimeters in the first eighteen months and eight centimeters in the next fourteen months. The slow growth velocity in the initial phases were probably due to non availability of the drug due to the lockdown and uh, some poor compliance issues due to the uh mother she expired due to covid and she was under the care of her paternal aunt but uh, post lockdown her compliance seems to be good and she's on proper follow up her uh, current growth hormone dosing is 0.16 units per kg per day that is 0.37 mg per kg per week her smr is uh, prepubertal and the bone age right now is 11 years her chronological age now is 13 years her uh, follow up thyroid function test uh, has been normal and uh, she's on calcium and vitamin d supplementation uh, the insulin like growth factor 1 and ttg uh, levels could not be done due to logistic reasons uh, this is a growth chart uh, this is the growth curve of this child and uh, these two black arrows um, indicate where she has not received growth hormones due to the lockdown coming to discussion uh, causes of short stature in turners it is mostly due to hormonal deficiency like growth hormone or hypothyroidism and probable skeletal dysplasias 
There have been studies which have well documented skeletal differences in the cranium, sternum, upper and lower ex extremities, spine and feet, and uh, deficiency of the shocks gene, uh, which leads to dysregulated chondrocyte differentiation and maturation, and um, uh, deletion of uh, additional genes from the short arm of X chromosome. And um, it is uh, documented that growth hormone does not uh, correct the underlying skeletal defects. Uh, the natural growth of uh, children in, with Turner syndrome. Uh, in early childhood, the child uh, up to three years of age, the growth is usually normal and uh, starts to fall by the age of three to, three to 10 years. And the child becomes the shortest at 10 years of age. Usually, uh, children with child, Turner syndrome don't have a pubertal uh, height spurt. But uh, in case of mosaics, they might have a minimal height spurt but occurs over a long period of time. Even if uh, it is present, it occurs over a long period of time. Uh, and uh, the final adult height in the Turner syndrome is almost 20 centimeters lesser than a normal person. Uh, the time of initiation of growth hormone uh, in a Turner syndrome, according to the 2016 Cincinnati uh, Clinical Practice Guidelines for uh, Management of Turner Syndrome, growth hormone supplementation should be begun at four to six years of age, preferably before 12 to 13 years of age. And uh, it should be started earlier in a child, a short child with height velocity less than the 50th percentile for the last six months in the absence of other causes or with a history of short parents or with a child with signs of puberty at presentation. The growth hormone should be initially started at a dose of 45 to 50 micrograms per kg per day, that is 0.35 to 0.375 milligram per kg per week, and can be reached up to a maximum of 68 micrograms per kg per day, that is 0.45 to 0.5 milligram per kg per week, if the adult height potential is uh, compromised. Monitoring of growth hormone therapy during Turner syndrome is usually with insulin-like growth factor levels. Uh, the goal of uh, insulin-like growth factor one level is should be less than two standard uh, deviation. If it is uh, above the three uh, score, it should be the reduce of uh, growth. The gro dose of growth hormone should be reduced. If it is between um, plus two and plus three, one should uh, decide on the dose uh, dose of growth hormone depending on the clinical judgment. And um, factors predicting the response of growth hormone in Turner syndrome is um, usually uh, uh, relatively tall height at initiation of therapy, tall parental heights, young age at initiation of therapy, and longer period of treatment before in induction of puberty, and long duration of therapy and higher growth hormone dose. Um, coming to the indications of oxalrone, it... Uh, Oxalron improves the growth by act, acting directly at the growth, uh, growth plate and increasing the IGF-1 concentration. It increases height alone or in combination with growth hormone. It is usually not used in all children. It is used for children whose uh, growth hormone uh, initiation is delayed or poor response to growth hormone therapy is there. The dose is 0 0.03 mg per kg per day. Maximum is 0 0.05 mg per kg per day. Adverse effects include dose dependent virilization and hepatotoxicity. Uh, pubertal induction of internal syndrome usually begins at 11 to 12 years. And it is if uh, gonadotropins or AMH are normal for the age, we have to observe for the spontaneous uh, appearance of spontaneous puberty. Or uh, low doses of e estrogen are begin. And uh, growth hormone therapy can be continued uh, till the bone age is uh, more than or equal to four years and the height velocity is less than 2.5 centimeters in a year. And uh, the dose is incremented every six months over a period of two to three years. And the progesterone is added once breakthrough bleeding occurs or after two years of treatment. The preferred uh, preparation for uh, prebuttal induction is estrogen valerate at a dose of 0.25 mg per kg per day with a maximum of 1 to 4 mg per day and transdermal estradiol 3 to 7 micrograms per day uh, the maximum dose of 25 to 100 microgram per day thank you yeah thank you reshma um, are there any questions i don't see any questions in the box so um, I'm going to be introducing our uh, distinguished speaker for this evening, Dr. Shanley Davis, 
Ma'am, one yeah. question is that we have one question is there. Oh, there is a question? Okay, fine. Let me uh, see. So, Dr. Jost has asked, uh, uh, IGF-1 between two to three standard deviation, one has to take clinical decision for GH uh, continuation at the same dose. What clinical decision? Labs give a value of two plus two standard deviation. How do we know three standard deviations? Okay. Um, see, uh, we can we can measure the value of uh, plus two. So and divide it like into two parts, and one more than that would be minus three standard deviations. That's how I usually calculate. Um, and the clinical decision to maintain the same dose or reduce the dose is I would if the growth velocity was poor and we had increased the dose, and the growth velocity is better now then maybe the clinical decision to continue the higher dose would be taken. Uh, so uh, that, that would be one of the clinical decisions that I would take after ruling out any other causes of poor growth like uh, concomitant hypothyroidism or celiac uh, that could possibly interfere with growth. Uh, one other question is then, uh, is karyotype recommended in short stature for female child presenting at any age? Yes, karyotyping would be recommended for any short female child. Yes. And uh, a minimum of 30 cells we have to see. Yes, absolutely. For more time. One, one more question uh, uh, regarding uh, presence of Y chromosome material. I mean, can right. you uh, uh, put some light on that? Uh... Um, right. So, um, uh, if, if routinely we don't need to screen children for presence of Y chromosomal material, um, but if the child is showing any signs of virilization like clitromegaly, we need to screen them for the presence of uh, cryptic Y chromosomal material. Um, so uh, does it answer the question? Uh, madam, because uh, I mean, if, if there is a virilization, then perhaps uh, uh, the gonadoblastoma or uh, it has already uh, set in. So, uh, shall we uh, do uh, search for it or uh, uh, cryptic Y uh, proactively? Or I don't know. I mean, I have been doing this, but uh, couldn't find any lab who which uh, uh, do it uh, convincingly. So that's why that, that, that was the question. Uh, actually, the consensus guidelines doesn't recommend routine screening for uh, cryptic Y. Yes. Okay. We'll get an answer by Dr. Stanley for that. Yeah. Yes. Okay, yeah, so, Reshma, Arish, in your case, um, the response was not that great, right? Yes, ma'am. I know there was pandemic, there was a little bit uh, of uh, um, compliance problem, but still, do you, do you think uh, Divya was looking after, so Divya? Yeah, yes ma'am. <laughs> so uh, the another uh, thing is that uh, this child is from the underprivileged sector and was receiving growth hormone from uh, uh, government hospital. So we couldn't start straight away with a higher dose uh, of growth hormone compared to uh, you know, and what is recommended. So we started at a lower dose. Uh, but of course, for the past one year, her compliance is good and the dose is, uh, we, I mean, she has been receiving like 0.37 microgram, uh, milligram per kg uh, per week. Uh, we are planning to increase it a little more. And also like because she's uh, 13, like she has crossed the pubertal initiation that uh, we usually do uh, in Turner syndrome. Uh, so, like, I would like to hear from the experts, like, whether we should uh, really go for growth hormone, um, uh, you know, at 11 years, 11 years to 12 years of age, or should we, like, if the growth hormone has been initiated late, like in our patient, so should we uh, wait and start, like, uh, you know, at present we are planning to initiate low dose estrogen now in our next visit? I think she has grown. Uh... 8 centimeter even in that last year. So it is a good response uh, yes. if you take Turner syndrome. So we can continue and there is a scope for increasing the dose. And also small dose estrogen also would help. I think you should continue growth hormone, increasing the dose and small dose of estrogen would help her. 
yes, uh, and and it's good and uh, uh, also it is uh, we like to share that uh, all over India only in two three places we get uh, free growth hormone. So in Chennai, uh, she has got it and she is lucky. Doctor Savas, please. Yeah, I think the dose, the starting dose, is very important because you want to get as much catch up growth as possible. And I think, I think you should try to get up to a dose of 50 micrograms per kilogram per day. And so I would, uh, if you can do that, I would continue for as long as possible okay. and also induce puberty, as you suggest, at the age of about 12 years. But the starting dose is very important. So uh, it'd be like uh, you know the as usual we start with the one fourth of the uh, I mean estradiol value rate one mg zero point two five mg like on alternate days will be better to go with in order to go for a lower dose. Sorry, I I didn't really get that. I, I'm 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 not really an expert on on estrogen replacement to be honest. I I was talking about the the dose of growth hormone. Dose of growth hormone. Yeah. Yes, sir. That uh, I have planned to increase because we have some like you know uh, logistic issues when increasing growth hormone dose, especially when the child receives from a government sector. So uh, we need to give proper explanation, and then like you know, which is then will be accepted by the uh, government health insurance. And yeah, I understand. Yeah, I understand. Yes, sir. But we are planning to increase the dose on growth hormone. Yes, sir. Okay. Any comments, so, Dr. Shanley, please, regarding this case management? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, I would, I would echo everything that's already been said. Um, I'm also not familiar, or as familiar with the every other day dosing. Typically in the U.S., we use the transdermal estradiol, and we cut the patch into quarters, and so we start at a very low dose, but still. Um, have daily estrogen essentially exposure. Um, I have seen that the uh, estrogen initiation will um, help with some of the growth spurt. Um, you know, I do think that uh, that would be in addition to increasing the growth hormone dose um, would be indicated. Thank you. So one more question is there, Divya? The chat. I, I, I'm just checking. Give me a second. Oh, that's all. We don't have. Yeah, Kavita, we can move on. Sure. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Shanley Davis. She is an assistant professor at the University of Colorado. She's the director of Extraordinary Kids Turner Syndrome Clinic at Children's Hospital, uh, uh, Colorado. She, her research interests uh, include, um, involve improving clinical outcomes in individuals affected by X and Y chromosomal variations. Over to you, Dr. Shandley. Thank you. Great. Thank you guys so much for inviting me to talk this morning or this evening for you guys. Um, let me go ahead and start sharing. Can you nod if you can see my slides okay? Very okay. good. Excellent. Sounds good. Thank you. And I apologize. I know that there's some light reflection. Uh, usually when I have this background on, I'm not actually outside, but today, this morning I am um, because we're in a hotel room and my kids are still sleeping in the hotel. So I am outside in the patio. Um, I am talking today on giving you guys an update on the management of Turner syndrome for children and uh, coming from a pediatric endocrinology perspective, as all of you are, I actually um, focused a lot of this talk on some of the other conditions um, and considerations that I encourage people to have. Um, often the endocrinologist uh, plays the role of kind of quarterbacking all of the medical um, uh, manifestations of Turner syndrome. And I think it's important for us, particularly if you don't have a multidisciplinary clinic to be able to um, work in coordination with your colleagues, um, it's a good idea to have a good understanding of what the rest of the um, non-endocrine features of Turner syndrome are as well. 
All right. So as I'm sure most people on this talk know, Turner syndrome was first described and named by Dr. Henry Turner back in 1938, who was an endocrinologist. And this was the the uh, clinical um, manifestations that he described and then was later identified to be secondary to either the complete or partial absence of the second sex chromosome. And this can be due to a non-disjunction event um, in during meiosis or mitosis, or it can be due to chromosomal breakage uh, resulting in isochromosomes, rings, translocations, and other structural defects. The prevalence of Turner syndrome is estimated to be one in 2,500 live, live born females, but it actually occurs much more frequently um, in utero. However, most of the monosomy X fetuses uh, will spontaneously abort. There are, as has already been alluded to, um, management guidelines that were published in 2017 that were internationally represented, represented from um, experts in many different specialties. And if you are not already familiar with these, um, I recommend downloading them and having them available. They are an excellent resource and they are available for free. There is also a resource for families that has been developed as well based off of these guidelines that um, allows uh, girls and families to be advocates for their own health care as well. And I recommend um, also, uh, if you don't have anything already available for your patients, um, having that as a resource as well. All right, so to jump in, the physical features of Turner syndrome, the most um, obvious one that everyone uh, already mentioned on this call is, is short stature and decreased growth velocity that really starts in, can start um, as early as in utero, but it really becomes evident um, by childhood. We also see, can see some physical features, particularly in the non-mosaic monosomy X, including a low posterior hairline, web neck, um, a cystic hygroma that can be present uh, in utero and persist later on as well. We also can see um, puffier hands and feet and uh, wide space nipples, uh, cubitus valgus, which is the carrying angle of the arms at the elbow where they turn out. Uh, short uh, fourth metacarpals and metatarsals and nail dysplasia and a high arched palate are some of the characteristic physical features that um, are described in Turner syndrome. So indications for testing, this came up just a, a minute ago from a question. So yes, the answer, any unexplained growth failure in a female should result in um, testing for Turner syndrome with a, a, a karyotype on peripheral blood. Um, they also, if you have a pubertal delay that's unexplained in a female, they also, that is an indication for testing for Turner syndrome, any of those characteristic features that we just talked about on the last slide. And then importantly, any female with left-sided cardiac anomalies, including just as simple as a bicuspid aortic valve should have, um, genetic testing for Turner syndrome as well, even in absence of the other, uh, findings. And then finally, um, females with premature ovarian insufficiency, um, so essentially uh, either delayed puberty, um, secondary amenorrhea, uh, or premature menopause. And then if you have two of the following kind of more minor features, including any of these listed here, these are also indications for testing um, uh, girls, with, girls for Turner syndrome. And these are all per the guidelines. So how do we test? So I'm not sure in India if you guys have cell-free fetal DNA as a routine clinical test that's available in pregnancy, but this has been become very, very common in the US and really um, uh, identifying a lot of particularly mosaic Turner syndrome that may have not been identified, certainly in infancy, maybe not even ever potentially. Um, so it is, it is an important uh, recognition or screening tool, but it is not a diagnostic test. So we also call this non-invasive prenatal testing uh, or NIPT in the US. Um, in the prenatal period, we can also see some features on ultrasound in some girls in about 30% of girls with Turner syndrome, we might see an increased nuchal fold and or a cystic hygroma. 
those left-sided cardiac defects that I mentioned before, poly or oligohydraminose and um, intrauterine growth restriction are all described in the prenatal period. Importantly, these are not, again, diagnostic for Turner syndrome, but they could raise suspicion and should uh, um, uh, make you confirm whether or not the child has Turner syndrome if any of these features are present. Um, for diagnostic testing in utero, this is um, chorionic villus sampling or amniocentesis. Importantly, uh, really a karyotype um, needs to be done on this tissue, not just fish. Fish fluorescence in situ hybridization is preliminary um, and we do really need that karyotype because there are so many structural defects of the X chromosome that can be present in Turner syndrome. So it's important to um, make sure that that is also obtained. And then even if testing is done prenatally, we recommend confirming postnatally. This can be done on cord blood or by a peripheral blood collection, or it can also be done on a second tissue type like a, a buccal swab um, or a skin fibroblast uh, um, biopsy. However, blood is obviously the easiest. Um, from a pediatric perspective, um, or in the, if you're testing for any of the indications that we had mentioned for symptoms, um, we recommend doing a standard karyotype on blood. This should be, as someone already mentioned, ideally out to 30 cells, but most of the time, even 20 cells, which is the standard would pick up Turner syndrome. Um, if you have a high suspicion, however, for Turner syndrome, and it's not demonstrated on that standard karyotype, you can actually uh, request the lab to do an extended cell count, which usually goes up to 50 cells on the karyotype or consider fish studies um, that would look at 200 cells, um, but again, not pick up those structural defects necessarily, but could detect lower level of, of um, monosomy X mosaicism. And then finally, if you have a, a strong um, uh, suspicion for Turner syndrome that is still not identified on um, uh, peripheral lymphocytes, consider testing a second tissue like buccal um, if there is uh, obvious uh, features of Turner syndrome that, uh, that you want to rule out. So the recommendations and the rationale for the guidelines for testing, um, the emphasis that I want to, to show on this slide is that there are lots of different karyotypes that can all um, manifest with Turner syndrome uh, clinical features, the most common being monosomy X, which is 45% of cases. However, there are structural defects and mosaicism. And as importantly, as someone else mentioned, um, several different uh, karyotypes that can have Y chromosome material present as well. Um, estimates are about 10% of all girls with Turner syndrome will have some Y chromosome material. And the guidelines, as someone mentioned, does, do not say that we should specifically go looking or searching for why if we didn't see it on the original testing, um, but we should if there are any concerns um, for virilization or um, tall stature that a uh, taller stature than you would expect for Turner syndrome. Um, the other uh, we do at, in our clinic, if there is a monosomy X without any other cell lines, we do typically do a um, uh, buccal fish or at least a peripheral blood fish to rule out low level Y chromosome mosaicism. In some of the studies that have been done, they say that they uh, can will detect Y chromosome mosaicism in about 5% of those cases that were originally just 45X. Um, whether or not you uh, do anything differently with that low level of mosaicism that you find on fish is another clinical question and kind of why the guidelines didn't specify um, that we need to go looking for it. So, but we, we prefer in our clinic to have that more information and then have an informed discussion with the, the uh, family about options. Importantly, with any of these karyotypes, the guidelines recommend are, are, are universally recommended. So there are different genotype phenotype correlations that I'll get into in a little bit. However, regardless of, of, of what karyotype is present, all of the general surveillance management um, for described in these guidelines uh, apply to everyone. And my last point I'll make on this is, although the guidelines specifically say that uh, Turner syndrome is a diagnosis in females and excludes those with um, intersex or, or ambiguous genitalia and excludes males, 
Um, males can also have these karyotypes as well, particularly um, the monosomy X with uh, um, 46XY mosaicism. And uh, in a study, recent study that we published, we found just uh, very, very similar rates of cardiac defects and neuropsychological uh, manifestations um, in these boys as we did uh, girls with these, these exact karyotypes. And so we, I strongly um, emphasize that these individuals also need to be followed by these guidelines um, if there is a presence of monosomy X material. All right, um, so there is a, a genotype phenotype correlations that have been described, but they are variable. So in general, um, those with a uh, mosaicism for a typical 46XX cell line will often have a milder phenotype. Those with Y chromosome material are at increased risk of gonadoblastoma and the guidelines appropriately recommend that we remove those gonads um, to, be, uh, to decrease or to eliminate the risk of gonadoblastoma. And then finally, um, ring chromosomes are associated with an increased risk of neurodevelopmental problems and intellectual disability, although none of these are, are kind of a one-to-one -one relationship. And certainly, again, everyone with any of these are, uh, karyotypes are at risk for all of the manifestations of Turner syndrome. Okay, so growth in children with Turner syndrome. This was already mentioned in this uh, nice case uh, presentation as well, but short stature occurs in the large majority of individuals with Turner syndrome and growth falters really across childhood. So they start with a lower birth weight and then um, they have slower growth velocity throughout childhood. This is a curve here that you can see. Um, the typical, uh, this is a CDC curve, so um, or WHO similarly. This is the 50th percentile for typically growing girls with the uh, not Turner syndrome. And then these darker lines here are the Turner syndrome curves. So you can see really evident um, early on, but then a slower growth velocity really becomes apparent in the kind of early school age years. And then there's a lack of a pubertal growth spurt as well. These are all untreated girls um, with Turner syndrome. So the final height on average is um, around uh, a little over four and a half feet, and the degree of height deficit progresses um, over time. Factors that influence height in Turner syndrome include mosaicism. So if you have mosaicism for either Y chromosome material or even just a typical cell line, pure, if you have more of that P um, arm of the X present, then you will have less uh, influence on, on height. You'll have a more normal height. Um, the parents' heights and certainly probably ethnic uh, variability in that as well. And then their uh, timing of their puberty and overall physical health all can contribute to um, the Turner syndrome, uh, both growth in childhood as well as their final height. Um, things to consider with their overall physical health include uh, hypothyroidism, which girls have an increased risk for, as well as celiac disease, both of which influence growth if they're not treated. And um, we can also certainly girls with Turner syndrome can have other uh, uh, things that impact height as well, um, including uh, uh, chronic uh, heart disease that may be repaired, but still um, uh, can impact health, uh, feeding difficulties that we see uh, often in girls with Turner syndrome, particularly early on in life, and um, uh, liver disease as well. So um, a lot of different contributors to height that can impact um, uh, the projection as well. All right, treatment. So uh, this has already been reviewed in the case that, that was excellent. So guidelines recommend starting treatment by age four to six years of age. Um, we uh, Growth hormone typically will increase height uh, around uh, up to eight centimeters, so a couple of inches. However, um, there are a lot of different things that can predict how well you respond, including the most, uh, the most significant one being how um, how long you are on therapy and the dose of therapy as well. Uh, we obviously stop treatment either when the child has reached a height that they're happy with or their growth potential ends. And so around a bone age of, of 13 and a half to 14, we want to stop um, uh, the growth hormone. 
Oxandrolone uh, was mentioned as well. This is in the guidelines uh, because there have been multiple studies that have added this treatment to growth hormones. So oxandrolone is an androgen that uh, cannot be converted into estrogen. And so it's non-aromatizable and supposedly doesn't have um, an impact on the uh, bone age advancement that you would expect with uh, either typical androgens or, or estrogen. However, the um, uh, side effects of oxandrolone include virilization, so acne, hirsutism, clitoromegaly, um, slower breast development, and voice deepening as well. We um, do see an increased growth of around two to five centimeters with oxandrolone per the studies um, when this is added to growth hormone treatment. However, in my clinical experience, I don't think it's been that great. Um, there's also a pretty limited amount of time in which the guidelines recommend being on oxandrolone. So starting around age 10 years of age at the earliest, um, although some of the studies started at age eight years of age, it's not very much longer before you would be starting estradiol as your sex steroid um, at that point anyway. Long story short is I don't find a huge benefit for using oxandrolone, except in kids that we really, um, that height is really important to them and their family, and they are not responding very well to growth hormone or potentially had a late diagnosis. And then um, estradiol is also a treatment in and of itself for short stature because we can um, help that pubertal growth spurt a little bit. Um, again, low dose estradiol is more beneficial because you have advancement in the bone age, um, the higher doses you go. So puberty induction in Turner syndrome. So the majority of girls will have ovarian insufficiency, and this will result in both estrogen and progesterone deficiencies. We see um, no breast development in about two thirds of girls with Turner syndrome and no um, spontaneous menses in, in the majority of girls with Turner syndrome. However, they do have continued adrenal function. And so they develop pubic hair, axillary hair, and acne. Um, it's important to counsel patients that this is not true puberty because I've had uh, more than one patient be excited that uh, they think that they are going to be one of the lucky few that have ovarian function when they start developing pubic hair. Um, the goal of estrogen and hormone replacement is really to mimic typical pubertal development. And so the guidelines do recommend starting around 11 to 12 years of age and, um, and continuing low and slow with the goal of, of increasing um, uh, slowly over, over around three years period of time up to full adult dosing. And um, like I mentioned, we typically start with the transdermal patches. We uh, feel like this is more uh, physiological, although there's a lot of uh, uh, a research that needs to be done in this area as far as whether or not there are measurable benefits um, from a health perspective to transdermal versus oral estrogen. And then progesterone replacement um, begins two years or so after being on estrogen, or if they have a breakthrough vaginal bleeding, we start progesterone for uterine protection at that time. Um, the guidelines uh, say that uh, in talking to my, my gynecology colleagues, we've come up with um, options for progesterone replacement. Typically, uh, this is given on days one through 10 of the month in a pill form and then induces vaginal bleeding after the uh, progesterone is, is stopped or withdrawn. However, if you, um, I, I say one of the few things that these, that girls with Turner syndrome um, have an advantage for is that they can choose not to have uh, menses and give continuous progesterone, which is um, safe and effective and uh, should result in no vaginal bleeding, so no periods that they have to deal with and still provide uh, uterine protection. There are other options to giving progesterone as well, including um, uh, inner uh, uterine devices, IUDs. Um, so how you assess ovarian function, this is not actually in the guidelines, but I wanted to have a slide in here because I think it is um, very interesting and something that we need to certainly learn more about. So the, um, particularly as a lot of our patients these days are being identified for, from the cell-free fetal DNA testing in utero and then diagnosed um, uh, uh, definitively in infancy, we have an opportunity to look at their ovarian function during the mini puberty period of infancy. And this is in girls in the first couple of years of life. Um, for sure, for sure uh, before two years, some studies stay up to three years of life. Um, 
And we can test uh, the HPG access, so particularly gonadotropins, LH and FSH at this time. Now, this gives us a, a window of what's happening during infancy, but there's actually, and an, you know, usually we would say, well, if your gonadotropins are already elevated uh, during the mini puberty period of infancy, you already have ovarian uh, uh, failure and are not going to be one of the few that would have spontaneous development uh, during tr the true puberty period, and likewise not have uh, really fertility. Uh, preservation options as well. However, there's not really any longitudinal studies that have looked at the mini puberty period of infancy and how well um, those labs predict later um, pubertal development, and in particular, whether or not there are actual cutoffs. And um, that's something that I think is, is still needed. Um, Anti-malarian hormone or AMH can be measured at any age because this is produced by the granulosa cells in the ovaries in, in addition to what we typically think of about the Sertoli cells in the testes. Um, in females, AMH can serve as a biomarker of the presence of ovarian follicles. And so if you have detectable AMH, um, you are, are more likely to have ovarian function. Again, that is at that particular time, there is a limited amount of studies that have looked at uh, kind of longitudinal AMH. Um, um, this is one of those studies that have looked at uh, um, 120 Turner syndrome patients, some of which had multiple lab values drawn here. And this top uh, um, graph is AMH in individuals with non-mosaic 45X, and you can see the AMH on the uh, Y, or, yes, sorry, the Y axis here and age on the X axis. Most of the points we have on uh, at essentially zero. So there is no detectable AMH. It was the lower limit of their assay that they were able to detect, or that, sorry, that they weren't able to detect in most of these girls. However, in a lot of the girls with mosaic um, forms of, um, Turner syndrome, or even the miscellaneous karyotypes, they see um, you can detect uh, AMH even in um, young adulthood here in several of them. And so this can be a um, marker that we use to be able to provide more individualized assessment of whether or not they will have spontaneous puberty and or are more likely to have spontaneous puberty or really um, have no uh, no chance of that versus as well as um, some interest in fertility preservation, which I'll get into in a little bit as well. All right, so the guidelines have a great table that um, have recommendations for all of the surveillance management in girls with Turner syndrome um, and when this should be occurring. From an endocrine perspective, um, I usually kind of take ownership of making sure all of these uh, labs get done um, or, or assessments get done, even if they are not uh, uh, traditionally endocrine related. So obviously things like thyroid um, function is well in our wheelhouse, whereas things like liver function um, may not be, but those are all of the screening that we, um, that kind of we take over in our institution from an endocrine perspective. So, um, Girls with Turner syndrome are at an increased risk for different cardiometabolic disease, um, both acquired and obviously congenital. From the acquired perspective, that is why we monitor for um, obesity as well as uh, lipid panels. The guidelines actually say just to do lipids in adulthood, we typically do screen in childhood as well, um, at least once around age 10. And that's per our kind of standard guidelines for all children, not just with Turner syndrome. And then if they're abnormal, we screen more frequently after that, or if they have other risk factors like obesity or family history. Um, and then we also pretty much at age 10 start all of the others cardiometabolic screening as well for liver dysfunction and diabetes. Um, we do screen for vitamin D deficiency, not because girls with Turner syndrome are at a higher risk for vitamin D deficiency than the general population, but they are, um, uh, vitamin D is obviously one of the key factors for developing strong bones. And we know that there's an increased risk of osteoporosis. And so I described to families that we just want to make sure all of the ingredients that we need are there um, to, to minimize any additional risk factors. Um, and then I won't uh, belabor all of the other evaluations here because I'm going to go into some of them on the next slides as well. Um, and I am going to switch places real quick because the sun is in my eyes. So, 
Okay, this is better. Okay, cardiology care for girls with Turner syndrome. The emphasis here is that this is a lifelong process. It is not just that you have one normal echocardiogram and you no longer have to have any uh, cardiac uh, follow-up. This is um, screening is very important for asymptomatic uh, congenital heart disease in adulthood as well. And a, a, I shouldn't say just congenital heart, but uh, aortic disease. Um, and sorry, not just congenital, but acquired. So congenital heart defects occur in around half of girls with Turner syndrome, the most common being bicuspid aortic valve, which occurs in around uh, 15 to 30%, depending upon uh, what karyotypes you're all including and looking at in the study. Importantly, partial anomalous pulmonary venous return or PAPVR is also very common in Turner syndrome and can uh, both be missed on echocardiogram, depending upon the views that they're able to get, as well as uh, can be silent from a clinical perspective uh, or can result just in um, impaired growth or poor growth um, without any, any other features. We've had several girls that have had PAP VRs repaired and have had um, much improved growth after um, those surgeries were completed. Um, Coarctation of the aorta is obviously what we classically think about in girls with Turner syndrome, but occurs in the minority, only around 10%. Um, Certainly, we can see more complex or severe lesions like left hypoplastic heart, but those are obviously usually detected on antenatal ultrasound um, uh, before uh, or shortly after birth. Um, we can also see more minor defects. And again, the important uh, emphasis here is that some of these defects can be silent and some of them, um, or and cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death in individuals with Turner syndrome with a three times increased standardized mortality rate. And so paying attention to both congenital and acquired heart disease is really, really key. Um, the dilation of the aorta is uh, describes an aorta that is larger than normal. And importantly, this does have norms that is are specific to Turner syndrome because Turner syndrome girls are have a shorter height um, and that needs to be taken into account. Um, the, the aortic aneurysm is a di severe dilation um, that is at higher risk for dissection. We'll go into that on the next page as well with the nice study that was done. And then aortic dissection is actually a tear or rupture of an aneurysm and is a life-threatening emergency. Um, in this slide here, this shows that uh, the uh, these are individuals that had um, aortic dissection. Um, and I'll put together from a, a, uh, uh, all of the case reports that were published at this time, essentially measurements prior to aortic dissection um, are in these uh, triangles here. And the emphasis here is you can see that um, the majority, all but one, were really above this 4.1 centimeter cutoff. So the emphasis here is that if we are monitoring appropriately um, and progressively over time, we should be able to uh, identify these girls who are at highest risk for dissection and um, intervene early. There are certain risk factors as listed here um, for, for aortic dissection as well. There is a nice um, cardiac surveillance algorithm, which I won't get into, but again, emphasize that this does not stop um, with one normal echocardiogram or even when they get out of the pediatric period and really emphasizing to your patients um, that they need to return to for cardiac monitoring. Um, even if their initial cardiologist says, yep, everything is okay, you're good to go. Um, emphasizing that that's not actually the recommendations for Turner syndrome. They need to have ongoing management and how frequently that is really depends upon um, what the findings were and um, um, what their other risk factors are as well. So at minimum, every five years in childhood with an echocardiogram and, and or a um, MRI, cardiac MRI, and in adulthood, again, every five to 10 years. And that is with the lowest risk group that has um, a completely normal heart and aorta on, on imaging. Um, I'm going to skip this. This is a little bit more detailed, um, just looking at the differences between uh, echo and cardiac MRI. Uh, we do do cardiac MRI at least once, once the child is able to um, 
uh, undergo an MRI without anesthesia. And this is because it can identify structural defects that are missed on echocardiogram and particularly PAPVR. Um, other cardi cardiovascular issues in Turner syndrome are also important. There is a um, high risk of hypertension, and because of the subsequent risk for aorta, aortic um, abnormalities and vasculopathies, we are pretty aggressive about treating hypertension in Turner syndrome. Um, they are at risk for a prolonged QT interval, and that definitely is, is especially those with monosomy X uh, karyotypes. So you can see in this uh, uh, image here. This is the QTC or the corrected uh, QT interval in milliseconds in monosomy X versus those uh, with um, mosaicism up here. Actually, I apologize. This is actually uh, typical females, not mosaic females. You can see that the, um, the uh, curve is definitely shifted to the right. We also, as I mentioned, see an increased risk of obesity, hyperlipidemia, and then um, uh, lymphedema, which can cause problems later in life as well, more from a symptomatic perspective. Okay, shifting gears here. I know that I'm going a little long, so I uh, apologize. I'll do this last part uh, fairly quickly, but neuropsychological risks in Turner syndrome um, actually can be the most uh, significant uh, for girls from a lifelong perspective. And although there's no in, um, there's, there is an increased risk of intellectual disability, but we typically don't think of um, intellectual impairment being part of Turner syndrome uh, phenotype. There is a, a definite um, uh, areas of vulnerability that are important to pay attention to. And these can include um, social skills deficits and attentional problems, um, difficulties with learning and math or these um, um, uh, visual spatial areas of weakness, and then also anxiety and depression um, and some behavioral concerns as well. So uh, the guidelines recommend that we um, pay attention to this and that these girls get screening for uh, screening and routine evaluations for neuropsychological risks as well. Um, there are karyotype variability, as I already mentioned, the, those with a ring chromosome are more likely to be, have some of these uh, more significant cognitive impairments. Certainly there are other genes that are involved. Um, and if you have a family history of some of these areas of vulnerability, particularly social emotional uh, concerns or the psych psychological um, impairments, this is something we, we can see as well um, in girls with Turner syndrome have a higher risk if they have a higher family uh, history and then medical comorbidities um, as well. There are several interventions that can be uh, used for girls with Turner syndrome, although there's no specifically studied uh, in, in Turner syndrome specifically. We know that early intervention and indi individualized education plans can support their um, development and their early academics. We know that cognitive behavioral therapy is particularly effective for things like anxiety and depression and participation in social interventions um, for some of the more subtle um, peer-to-peer interactions as well. And then um, obviously uh, supporting any medical diagnoses and um, uh, um, providing occupational therapy. So particularly driving and vocational supports as needed as well. Um, the neurological, neuropsychological recommendations per the guidelines say that neuropsychological um, care should be integrated in for girls with Turner syndrome, that uh, there should be annual screenings and that full assessments should take place at key transition stages in schooling. So entering school and transitioning to um, more advanced learning. However, um, even in our multidisciplinary center where we have three different um, specialists dedicated to this field, uh, specifically for girls with Turner syndrome, we still have difficulties meeting these uh, recommendations for all girls um, because this is uh, the resources are scarce, um, both for evaluation as well as for um, implementation of, of those interventions we were talking about. So a lot of work that needs to be done in this area. And then finally, um, I want to uh, emphasize the importance of screening for hearing loss. Similarly to the cardiovascular assessment, this is not a one-time check the box. Um, all is good if their hearing test is normal. This can be um, progressive and, uh, over time and, and um, acquired later on. So uh, those with recurrent otitis media and or um, 
uh, effusion are most commonly affected with conductive hearing loss. Um, we know that tympanostomy tube replacement ends up being required for about a third of girls with Turner syndrome. And we recommend being proactive if they are having um, recurrent otitis or effusions. Um, However, the sensory neural hearing loss is different from the conductive hearing loss. And this is, um, it can present at a more, at an earlier age than what is in the general population, but progresses at, and progresses at a faster rate. And this is the most kind of detrimental because it can't just be fixed with uh, uh, tube uh, tubes. Um, the, importantly, the progressive hearing loss um, does seem to be more common with those with a history of recurrent ear infections. And um, the there's specific uh, frequencies that are actually often missed in screening tests. Um, so this next slide here goes over that a little bit, that this, the hearing tests that our school systems do here in the US, as well as primary care physicians, um, do not screen for some of the most uh, uh, frequently affected or early signs of sensory neural hearing loss in girls with Turner syndrome. And so really a full audiological evaluation is recommended. We recommend annually um, until age five and then every three years after if everything else is normal with counseling that they should have a test done um, uh, sooner if they have any uh, changes in their hearing. Okay, and then a, a one last slide on fertility. So um, this is uh, obviously something that is uh, pretty universally impacted for individuals with Turner syndrome is it's either infertility or at least subfertility. Um, spontaneous pregnancies in non-mosaic um, uh, Turner syndrome are very rare and um, or, or even non-heard of, um, but in mosaic forms, there is an increase, or there is a, a possibility that they can become spontaneously pregnant. Um, however, there's a high risk of miscarriage uh, for individuals with Turner syndrome, as well as congenital anomalies in the fetus. Um, guidelines recommend considering oocyte preservation after um, age 12 in individuals that do have spontaneous puberty, although there are certainly resource limitations for this as well. And um, ovarian tissue cryopreservation is a more research base that essentially is taking an entire ovary in, in prepubertal girls or individuals um, that uh, may be pubertal but have um, are unable to undergo oocyte preservation for whatever reason. And this is a, still on a research basis. Um, it definitely is standard of care for those individuals that are going to undergo chemotherapy or other um, cancer uh, type risks um, for, for OTC preservation. However, in girls with Turner syndrome, they have not yet demonstrated that OTC, prepubertal OTC can result in a viable pregnancy later on. Um, importantly, regardless of, of how or if they're able to have uh, fertility preservation, there remains a high risk of obstetrical and cardiac complications in the pregnancy that needs to be counseled on. And um, I always emphasize to my patients, my parents of young moms that they, or sorry, of young kids, um, really emphasizing in a healthy way that um, there are many ways to be a parent, to be a mommy, that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to carry the pregnancy yourself. Um, this is a slide from our, our clinic. This is the play area where our girls um, can go when they're in between clinic visits. We have all of our multidisciplinary specialists all see the patients in the same space um, and the girls, we kind of rotate through the different rooms, if you will, um, giving patients really a one-stop shop for their convenience, as well as being able to integrate the care that we're providing and give the same message. It also allows the patients to have an opportunity to meet other girls with Turner syndrome as well and learn, um, uh, they can learn from each other as well as the providers that are all working together can learn um, and have opportunities for QI and research as well. And this is just some minimal research that we did essentially showing uh, with a um, three different major children's hospitals in the U.S., Boston Nationwide and our self Children's Hospital Colorado, that indeed, if they were seen in a multidisciplinary care, they were more likely to meet or achieve multiple different care recommendations per the guidelines. 
Um, and this is just another way to, to look at that. All of the MDC it, girls that had received care in an MDC setting or multidisciplinary care setting are in blue um, with multiple different uh, uh, guidelines down at the bottom there. And you can see for many of them, particularly things like um, psychological uh, counseling and um, developmental counseling, those that receive care in the MDC setting are much more likely to um, have met these guidelines. And with that, I will end with my take home points that um, there are consensus based screening and treatment guidelines published and that should be used when you're caring for girls with Turner syndrome. Turner syndrome is not just a pediatric or not just an endocrine problem, um, but as endocrinologists, as pediatric endocrinologists, we often serve as the as the um, kind of directors of all of the Turner syndrome related care. All karyotypes abide by the same surveillance management guidelines and coordinated multidisciplinary care um, is beneficial. I wanted to put in a quick plug, one of my mentees um, who's currently studying uh, undergraduate uh, at Harvard University um, started or founded the Turner Syndrome India, which um, I wanted to point out to you guys as a resource. Um, she holds uh, usually virtual conferences now since COVID uh, has occurred um, for all providers across the country and um, families as well. And so I, I recommend checking out this website for some of the resources that she has put together and developed um, um, and will hopefully continue to grow. Uh, I think she's planning her next conference for this upcoming summer. And with that, I want to also acknowledge all of my wonderful teammates um, at the Extraordinary Kids Clinic that I direct but could not do it without all of these wonderful um, uh, women as well. And I will ha happily take any questions. Do you want me to any questions in the chat? Uh, yeah, that would be okay, madam. Uh, you can you can do that. Okay. Um, Harry, there is a question. Uh, Q and A and ask us. Yeah, Q and A. So the first question says, how do you define low posterior hairline and high arch palate? Uh, those are completely subjective. Uh, so just looking at a lot of girls and say, it, you know, the high arch palate sometimes is pretty obvious. Like there is actually a notch sometimes um, where it is an, a, a significant indent, but sometimes it's just more narrow and higher arch than you would see in the general uh, population. And so it's, it's completely subjective though. So uh, the another question is karyotype with fish revealed 46 XY in suspected Turner syndrome due to delayed puberty and short stature. So is it possible to have a, a XY karyotype uh, in a girl who is presented with delayed puberty and short stature? Is it possible to have XY mosaicism? Yes. I, I, I'm not sure I'm completely understanding the question. Maybe I'll... Um... Okay, so we'll move on. Oh, to I see, one. I see. Okay. Yeah. This must be an actual case, a specific case that she, that, yeah. that this person had. Okay, so the, the, they had suspected Turner syndrome based on the phenotype and the karyotype returned 46XY. I suspect um, there's probably a monosomy X cell line in there, even if it's not uh, picking up on peripheral blood. And I would, I would uh, consider doing a second tissue type um, in that situation. I have had that um, with one other patient as well. Um, um, and definitely, obviously they need their gonads removed. Yeah, uh, one more uh, with the genetics. Do you look for Y material routinely in all monosomy X since your presentation mentions that it is 5% of them? And what test do you do? Uh, is it PCR or uh, for Y or something else? Yeah, so as, as I mentioned, the guidelines do not specifically recommend this. Uh, they say consider um, further testing for, for Y chromosome or cryptic Y material. We do not do PCR. Um, we do just do fish for Y, but we do um, 
uh, we do look for it, yes. And, and whether or not, we've kind of debated on whether or not we need to, um, but we, we are doing it because we figure that if they're coming to our multidisciplinary center, um, we should rule out, and we wouldn't wanna miss uh, Y chromosome material um, being present to at least counsel the families on that. And uh, does severe cardiovascular disease contraindicate treatment with sex steroids or growth hormone? Um, it does not. However, I always emphasize to patients that, you know, short stature is a height problem, not a health problem. And so there should be priorities. Um, and if they have a severe cardiovascular disease, that really needs to be the priority and taken, um, you know, put appropriately as the focus of that child's health care. So um, it often kind of takes a back seat for kids that have more um, severe medical complications and certainly wouldn't be something that we are pushing starting in those individuals. Although if they're, if they're wanting to um, start growth hormone and um, we certainly would start growth hormone. Um, sex steroids in, I just want to emphasize that that we are just replacing what is physiologically um, supposed to be there. And so we are not uh, providing super physiologic um, treatment. So whether or not, even if they have risk factors that you might uh, think twice about for estrogen, like we have one uh, girl that has Lee-Fermini syndrome in addition to Turner syndrome. And so she's at a high risk uh, for breast cancer and uh, estrogen uh, receptor positive breast cancer in particular. Um, however, we, her, she still needs physiologic estrogen. Um, that's still a, an important health um, contribution. So we're doing low doses of estrogen. We're not, we're keeping her on the lower side of the recommendations, but we are not, uh, we're not going to prevent her from going through puberty. Um, just like my, one of my mentors always said, you know, you don't remove the ovaries from somebody that's at risk, um, uh, for, or, you know, either cancer or clotting or things like that. And so we, we're just replacing what would physiologically normally be there. Growth hormone, Thank I think is a different Maya. consideration given that that is not replacing growth. It's usually not growth hormone deficiency we're treating. We're providing super physiologic growth hormone. Um, so that's a little bit of a different consideration. And yeah, things. perhaps Dr. Uh, Savage will be able to answer this uh, about growth hormone. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Davis, for uh, uh, this presentation. And uh, we would be thankful if you answer uh, uh, the remaining questions in the chat box. And we will move on to the next uh, part of this meeting. Uh, I would like to uh, go back to Dr. Shaila for further uh, Uh, Stuti, could you put the slide, please? So our next session will be on growth hormone deficiency and growth hormone treatment. Before that, we will be discussing a case of uh, short stature. For this, we have Dr. Suraksha RS. She is a junior resident, batch of 2020, Department of Pediatrics, Topiwala National Medical College and Nair Hospital, Mumbai. Mentors were... Mentors are sorry, uh, Dr. Surbi Rati and Dr. Urbi Agarwal. And the moderator for this session uh, would be Dr. IPS Kochar. Next slide, yeah. Dr. IPS Kochar, who, who is fellow in pediatric endocrinology from uh, London Gosh. And uh, he's presently uh, uh, working at Indraprastha Apollo Hospital, New Delhi, and Pushpanjali Medical Center, Delhi. Thank you, Dr. Kocher and uh, Dr. Suraksha. Over to you. Thank you, ma'am. Is my screen visible? Yes. Good evening, yep. everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Suraksha, second year resident uh, from Department of Pediatrics, Topiwala National Medical College in Nair, Mumbai. Uh, my mentors are Dr. Puri Agarwal, ma'am. Uh, today, I'm here to discuss a topic on primary empty cellar syndrome. Uh, two cases of primary empty cellar syndrome. Uh, case one, uh, this is a boy uh, born on 1st June 2019, two year, three month male, third by birth order, born out of non consignous marriage, came with complaint of inadequate height and weight gains in six months of age. 
there is no history of frequent loose stools or abdominal pain no history of pica or worms in stools there is no history of yellowish discoloration of the sclera or skin there was no history of bluish discoloration of lip skin there was no history of recurrent respiratory infection no history of decreased urine output or polyuria decreased food intake or recurrent infections there was no history of constipation lethargy or cold intolerance there was no history of headache or visual problems or no history of difficult to walk these uh, histories were asked to elicit any systemic involvement uh, in the child uh, birth history wise uh, the first child born to uh, the mother was a female child Uh, delivered by lower segment cesarean section cried immediately after birth birth weight was 2.5 kg baby was di- baby died on day of life 3 the cause was not known the second child was a, was a male child uh, born by lsus birth weight of 2.4 kg there was history of short phallic length and died on day of life day of life 11 the cause was not known the present child male child born to, born by full term lsus indication was previous lsus the cr- baby cried immediately after birth birth weight was 2.8 kg there was hyperbilirubinia anemia requiring phototherapy for 3 days in this child and the, the small phallus was ab- observed by parents and bilateral testes were in the scrotum uh, immunization history uh, child was immunized only at birth developmental history uh the child was developmentally appropriate for the age in all five domains uh, diet history uh, not taking adequate adequate calorie and proteins according to mother with mixed diet with a calorie de- deficit of 200 kilo calories and protein deficit of 6 grams the family in the family history then there was no history of delayed puberty in father or mother while coming to anthropometry height for age was 73 cm which was uh, at minus 5.23 standard standard deviation score weight for age was 9.2 kg which was minus 2.89 standard deviation score head circumference was 48 cm upper segment to lower segment ratio was 1.3 is to 1 mid parental height was 165 cm uh mp mid uh, weight for weight age was 10 months and height age was 8 months chronological age was 2 year 3 months bone age was done which was 16 months and weight for height was at minus 2.61 sds uh smr staging was done uh, st- stretch penile length was 1.6 cm and testicular volume was less than 1 cc head on head to toe examination chest abdomen spine were normal no dysmorphism except mid facial hypoplasia and frontal possum these were the clinical picture of the child uh, there was a short stature when compared to peer of the same age child was uh, proportionately short uh, there was mid facial hypoplasia with apparent frontal bossing uh, and uh, we could see a proportional short stature in this child systemic examination was done there was no abnormality identified so uh, to summarize we had a 2 year 3 month male child presenting with proportionate short stature most likely to be pathological in origin developmentally normal in immunized fully immunized uh, immunized for age a uh, differential diagnosis were first to be uh, endocrine cause second systemic cause third query uh, skeletal dysplasia coming to the second case it was 11 year 4 month old male child came with complaint of failure to gain height observed since 3 years of age age of 3 years short as compared to peers short at shortest in the class uh, there was also complaint of small size penis since birth urethral opening normal stream of urine normal with non palpable testes there was no history of poor weight gain not attained any sex, secondary sexual characters no history of recurrent lrti cyanosis cough cold fever no history of lois discoloration uh, no history suggestive of any systemic involvement as seen in case 1 birth history wise it was a full term normal vaginal delivery birth weight of 2.8 kg there was no history of hypoglycemia hyperbilirubinemia or seizures uh, there was no history of nicu state immunization history immunized only at birth developmental history appropriate for age in all five domains family history second by birth order no history of delayed puberty in parents no history of short stature or delayed puberty in parents diet history vegetarian diet and has no calorie or protein deficiency socio economic history lives with mother separated from pa- father but emotional support from mother and maternal family members is present Uh, uh, while coming to anthropometry of this child height for age was 112.5 cm which was coming at minus 4.71 the slide has not changed is it all visible yeah yeah 
minus 4.71 standard deviation score. Weight for age was 26.7 kg, which was minus 1.88 standard deviation score. BMI was 21.2. Head circumference was 52 centimeter. Upper segment to lower segment ratio was 0.8 is to 1. Mid parental height was 166.5 centimeter. Weight for weight age was 10 years. Height age was 5 years, 5 months. Chronological age was 11 year, 2 months. Bone age was 6 years. Uh, SMR staging, stretch penile length was 2 centimeter. P1, A1, non palpable testers. On head to toe examination, there was micro penis, there was a mid facial hyperplasia, and there was also central obesity. I did not change. Systemic examination, there was no uh, abnormality detected in any of the systems. To summarize this case, an apparently healthy 11 year, four month male child presenting with proportionate pathological short stature with signs of hypogonadism with hypothyroidism. Uh, differential diagnosis being endocrine etiology. Uh, so to summarize. Uh, I'll just summarize what, summarize what she says. That case one is a proportionate, uh, you know, pathological source of micropenis due to underlying suspected growth hormone deficiency, and case of isolated growth hormone deficiency. Uh, the case two was a proportionate pathological source stage of micropenis cryptoid testes due to underlying most probably endocrine cause. We don't know. Can you have the next slide, please? Next slide. So, uh, in, in the, when you evaluate a short stage in general, you go for some steps. So, step one, step two, and step three. Step one is basics. You go for the oxalgic criteria and bone age. Look for any dysmorphism, do the keratotyping, do a CBC electrolyte. Depending upon the case, how it is looking, you might need to do LFT, you might need to do a venous blood sampling, you might need to IG, TTG, and total IJ. So it's not as in all these things we've done it, but this is step one. Step two is going further on. You might like to do IGF-1, which normally the endocrinologists do all the access, you know, whether it involves cortisol, prolactin, FSH, LH, and then go for a growth hormone stimulation test. So if, if the first step is negative, then you want to step two. And the step three will be doing an MRI. In this patient, we very, very want to feel whether there's a small pituitary or whether there is you know, any ectopic pituitary or the, or the stock, the pituitary stock is involved. <clears throat> so uh, so the, that's the part. So Dr. Swex, how did you go in your patients? How did you go for this? You know, how did you go yes. well in the evaluation of this patient? Yes, sir. So we did uh, step one, two, and three for both case one and two. Uh, in first step, uh, bone aging was done. Bone age in case one was 16 months with the chronological age of two years, two months and eight months. So height age is less, less than bone age, less than chronological age. We did a systemic workup with, which showed a uh, hemogram of 9.9, uh, burn and creat of 15 and 0.38, sodium potassium chloride were within normal limit. LFTs and RFTs were normal limit. Calcium phosphorus ALP were in normal limits. The urine routine and stool routine done, which was normal. IGA, TTG and total IGA was done, which was also negative. Uh, for the first case, uh, 8 a.m. cortisol was 13.7, which was normal. Serum prolactin was done, which was 10.6, which was also normal. TSH, T3, T4 were done, which was within normal limits. After this, we did a clonidine stimulation test for this child. And uh, samples were collected at 0, 30, 60, 90, and 120 minutes. And 1.54 nanogram per ml was the high, uh, high, highest num uh, uh, growth hormone that was elicited, which was less than 7. Uh, then we went ahead with step 3, uh, where MRI was done, which was suggestive of prime partially empty cella with small pituitary gland with height of 3.5 millimeter, uh, age, age appropriate height was 4.5 millimeter and normal thickness pituitary stock. Uh, then coming back to case two, uh, the bone age of case two was six years with the systemic workups showing hemogram, hemoglobin of 12.9 with RFTs and LFTs and electrolytes being normal. Uh, BBG was also normal. Calcium was within normal range and there was uh, no abnormality in urine routine and stool routine and IgA, TTG and total IgA were negative. Uh, ATM cortisol was 11.6, serum prolactin was 8 which was also normal, TSH, T3 and T4 were done uh, in which uh, FT were, uh, FT4 was 0.7 uh, which was a secondary hypothyroidism for which we treated with LT4 and uh, after that we uh, uh, 
went ahead with a clonidine stimulation test after priming with testosterone uh, and the uh, samples were collected at 0 30 60 90 and 120 minutes and highest value we could elicit in this case was 0.1 IGF-1 was done, which was 15, and FSH and LH were 0.4 and 0.2. Ultrasound of inguinal region is bilateral hypoplastic with undescended testes. MRI was done for second case also, which showed complete, complete empty cella with J-shaped uh, cella with pituitary gland uh, non-visualized. Pituitary stalk was normal. So, uh, so talking a little bit about the myelin pan, that's very, she very nicely described both the cases. But both onwards started in both these cases at a dose of 15 24 micron per kg per day. And then they followed up, it was a plan to follow up these patients, see the growth velocity, monitor growth velocity, see for any adverse reaction of these, you know, the growth hormone that is matotropin, for any lipodystrophic, glucose intolerance, headache, papadema. <clears throat> and the IGF over one was measured over a period of once in two, two, six to 12 months. And very important thing with genetic analysis was also thought to be done in this patient because, especially with the second case, because having multiple pituitary hormone deficiency, thyroid deficiency, and growth hormone, maybe also he has gonadotropin. will come to know in the future as time goes on. So maybe you like to do, you know, rule out any prop one or pit one, any of these just genetic disorder, transcription factor disorder, growth hormone is there, and the other ones also. So therefore, that is there. And then in the basically, uh, you know, the empty cell is it's also called pituitary cell syndrome, or it's called empty cell syndrome. So there are two, you know, mainly it's etiology wise and the radiology wise. The etiology wise is basically it's primary, it's the cellular tashika is enla not enlarged, but basically you find, and it's the very common you will find many times you do an MRI, you might find normal empty cellular tashika and without any finding, any even endocrinological finding in that patient, in that person. <clears throat> then secondary, you know, maybe a bit of the tumor, maybe a radiation, surgery, trauma, information, drug induced. The commonest reason of having a this is because of again hypertension, that way you may have many cases you will have you know, <clears throat> cellular tashika, empty cellular tashika. So the various radiological types, there are two main, partial or complete. If your pituitary thickness is more than three millimeter and there's less than 50%, you know, of the CSM in the cellar, this is, you know, most part is partial empty cellar. But if you have a, you know, a, more than 50% of the, in the cell is occupied by the CSM and less than two meter thickness of the pituitary, it's complete. So this is, you know, basically what uh, in the empty cellar is in the and this this is commonly, you know, this is called primary empty cell in childhood. And uh, this, I think she'll discuss more about it. Over to you, Suraksha. So uh, basically, prevalence of primary empty cell in childhood is ill-defined. In adults, it is described in 5 to 8%. So if primary empty cell is present along with hormonal deficiency, then we call it primary empty cell syndrome. So uh, in both of our child, we will call them children. We call them as primary empty cell syndrome. Uh, there is no gender predilection according to literature. Uh, so coming back to if there are hormonal deficiency that have been identified in any child and going back to primary empty cell is like if the child has growth hormone deficiency out of 100 kids, 8.8% child uh, children are uh, found to be having primary empty cell. Uh, similarly, gonadotropin deficiency is associated with 5.9% of primary empty cell. Uh, coming the other way, if incidentally uh, there is primary empty cell syndrome, then if you go back and work them up, growth hormone deficiency is the most common hormonal uh, abnormality that you'll see. It is seen in a wide range of 4 to 58%, and other hormones like ACTH, TSH, FSH, LH, and PRL are seen in around 2 to 30%. So, though the range is very wide, uh, we need more studies in this topic uh, to find more about uh, the association in both the ways. Uh, that's about uh, primary empty cell syndrome. Thank you, Dr. Sasha. Any questions are there, uh, Dr. Shaira or Dr. Hari? Any questions can be there? So there is one question in the Q&A, sir. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, what is the genetic yield in empty cell syndrome? What is the? Genetic yield in empty cell syndrome. I think they are okay, asking genetic for genetic yield. Okay, genetic yield it may be not much because you know we are having we're talking about endocrine point of view. Empty cell syndrome is commonly seen in many normal patients without any endocrinology. So if you have an endocrinological issue with it, then when you do a genetic, you might pick up a pop one or pop one. 
pop one is you know they have both hormone deficiency thyroid deficiency then their patient they pick one and pop one both are there so they may have neurotrophic deficiency and this like in this child it, it is more a more there is a consanguine marriage family history of mutual or putative mutual or both hormone deficiency there when you are more helpful in doing genetic analysis that we there can't do genetic analysis for these patients any other question no i guess that's all sir those are questions so uh, dr shailar carry on dr kochar yes please continue okay so professor martin uh, also last week i was very lucky to work with him when i was in gosh so and we meet him in you know in barts hospital so he is professor of pediatric endocrinology uh, and uh, he is with the department of endocrinology william harvard research institute barts and royal london school of medicine and dentistry university of london so he was a, you know he was a, he is a clinician with clinical research in testing growth disorders especially those with abnormality in the growth hormone igf1 axis his main research has been in the phenotype genotylation of igf1 growth hormone igf axis defects notably growth hormone resistance So he was general secretary of the you know the European Society of Pediatric and SPE from 1997 to 2004. <clears throat> He's lectured in 60 countries all over the world and published more than 460. Everybody knows him very well, so I don't need to discuss more about him. I think back over to you, Dr. Martin. Please carry carry with the with us uh, with your talk. Please. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, I just need to share my screen. Share screen. So, can you see that? Yeah, I think you need to put in the you know this is a, you have to put in the presentation mode. Presentation mode. Light your sessions. Now that 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 is in that's in presentation mode. No, we are seeing all the slides. We're not seeing one slide. Okay. Okay. So um, I'm I'm actually putting it in slideshow. it's actually slide sorter sir so if you can go to the you know the slide that and then you can say start the slide show i think it'll come yeah yes. it's there now so yeah, it's okay yes is that good yeah it's very good yes right okay so okay let's go So thank you very much indeed for inviting me. It's really a great pleasure to join you and uh, to take part in this excellent meeting. I I really enjoyed the case presentations and Dr. Davis's excellent talk on Turner syndrome. So I'm going to talk to you about growth hormone deficiency. Let me just Um, and we will quickly go over the, the control of normal growth, classification of growth disorders, and then I'll take you into the clinic and we will look at the differential diagnosis of short stature and growth hormone deficiency, talk about specific pathogenesis, diagnosis, and unmet clinical needs related to the, the treatment of growth hormone deficiency and then treatment with growth hormone uh, before we finish. So as you know, childhood growth is, uh, is a smooth process and is dependent in infancy and fetal growth on nutrition. And then the growth hormone IGF-1 axis comes into play in childhood growth. And in puberty, it's a combination of sex steroids and an increased secretion of growth hormone. So this slide shows the growth hormone IGF-1 axis. 
And uh, growth hormone deficiency can be due to either a problem in the hypothalamus or in the pituitary gland. And when uh, there is deficiency of growth hormone, this translates to a deficiency of IGF-1 and a deficiency of the physiological effects of IGF-1, which are essentially anabolism and stimulation of clinical or of linear growth. As you know, growth hormone secretion is pulsatile. And the reason we need to do growth hormone stimulation tests is when you see a patient in your clinic at 10 o'clock in the morning, and you do a sing single blood sample for growth hormone and it is low, you do not know if this is growth hormone deficiency or a physiological trough. So we need, we need to artificially stimulate growth hormone release. IGF-1 is uh, produced in response to growth hormone binding to its receptors in, in many tissues of the body, but specifically in the liver where the highest concentration of growth hormone receptors are found. And IGF-1 is a small peptide which goes into the circulation shown here. Uh, and in the circulation, it binds to two carrier proteins, ALS, acid labile subunit, and IGF-BP3 to form a complex. In the, the form of this complex, IGF-1 is biologically inactive, but is released as an active uh, peptide to bind to its own receptors in peripheral tissues, for example, in the cartilage cells of the growth plate. And here it has a, an influence on the, the function of the growth plate. Now the growth plate is now considered to be the most important tissue in the body regulating linear growth. 10, 15, 20 years ago, people would have said, well, it's the hormonal system which is the most important. Now there is much more concentration on the activity of the growth plate because this is where chondrocyte cells uh, are produced and mature and proliferate and become hypertrophic and eventually become calcified as, as new bone. So the growth plate is crucial, but it is essentially regulated to, to some extent by the growth hormone IGF-1 axis with IGF-1 having an effect on proliferation and hypertrophy. And from that, you come to the classification of growth disorders. Um, and this now stems from the growth plate. So you have primary growth disorders, which are disorders of the, of the growth plate itself, with basically intrinsic defects within the growth plate. You have secondary growth disorders, which are effects from outside the, the, the skeleton, but influencing the function of the growth plate. And this is where the endocrine system comes in, together with nutrition, inflammation, et cetera. And then thirdly, you have unexplained short stature, generally uh, known as idiopathic short stature or idiopathic small for gestational age. Now, as, as you know, short stature can be caused by many, many uh, factors. The etiology is complex and it is necessary to exclude many causes of short stature before we can make a definitive diagnosis of growth hormone deficiency. So for this, I take you into the clinic and um, I always say that actually approaching a child with short stature is best done, not from the point of view of an endocrinologist, but from the point of view of a general pediatrician or physician. 
because you have to be able to think laterally. When you see a child and a family coming into the clinic, you have no idea uh, what the cause of the short stature is. And all the different categories of etiological categories are shown here. What is very important is that you have to recognize that clinical skills are useful and need to be learned because the assessment of short stature is as much an art than a science. When you look at a child and the family, when specifically when you look at the child, you will gain much more information by looking and listening to the child and the family than by looking at your computer screen. So you need to have a structure. And, and I notice you have step one, two, and three, and uh, I do things slightly differently, but essentially you start by taking the history. The history is very, very important. This is where you build a relationship with the family. You then go on to the physical examination and uh, oxology uh, is crucial here. There are certain bits of information which you need. You need the heights of the parents, you need the, the birth weight, the gestational age, and you need to look at the child critically. So you have to learn to become a skilled observer. And this is a clinical skill um, because when you go on to the next stage, you need to be able to see whether or not that child has any dysmorphic features. Of course, you have the height and the, and the height velocity and everything, all the other auxological information as well. But to looking, looking at the child critically is very important. <clears throat> you also need at some point to think laterally, and we've heard about uh, doing a karyotype for Turner syndrome. You, 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 somebody in the workup of the patient with short stature uh, needs to do sc general pediatric screening tests. Now, maybe they've been done already by the time uh, you see the patient, but uh, maybe they haven't. And if they haven't, it is up to the pediatric endocrinologist to do these general pediatric screening tests. Now, this is critic. This is debatable. There was a key paper by Dr. Sisley in 2013 saying that in healthy children, these screening tests are a waste of time. I fundamentally disagree with Dr. Sisley on that point. Somebody has to do the screening test at some point to exclude Turner, syn uh, Turner syndrome, celiac disease, um, Crohn's disease. Uh, otherwise, if these tests are not done, we will find that the patient with Crohn's disease, for example, becomes diagnosed as growth hormone deficiency. So these screening tests are very important. You then go on, uh, if provided they are all negative, to do a growth hormone stimulation test and can use a number of uh, different um, provocative agents, clonidine, uh, glucagon, insulin. Insulin is now used much less frequently because of the danger of hypoglycemia. Now, not every short child will need to have a growth hormone stimulation test. For example, if, they, uh, if they're growing normally, <clears throat> if their height is appropriate for the family, if the IGF-1 levels are above the 50th centile, then probably doesn't need a growth hormone stimulation test. But in other children, this test is necessary. Now, it's been criticized for being non-physiological, which it is, and non-reproducible, which it is, but nevertheless, it will distinguish children with growth hormone deficiency who have a peak growth hormone of less than seven uh, nanograms per mil on a test from children with normal growth hormone secretion, and that is a a distinction of fundamental importance. 
Some people take 10 as the cutoff in the US, but uh, mostly in Europe, we take seven nanograms per mil or micrograms per liter. Should you or not do a steroid, a sex steroid priming? I, I, I am in favor of this, not in every child, but in, in most children over the age of 10, because before the adolescent growth spurt, at this point here, physiological growth hormone secretion is low. And if you don't prime with sex steroids, you, you're likely to find a, have a low response in the growth hormone stimulation test. And you will not know if this is a healthy prepubertal child or a child with growth hormone deficiency. So for that reason, uh, we recommend uh, sex steroid priming. And uh, in boys and girls, we use still Bistrol, one milligram twice daily for the two days before the test, but you can use depot testosterone. So um, we then can make a diagnosis of growth hormone deficiency. And this shows the uh, etiological causes of growth hormone deficiency, either congenital or acquired, genetic mutations, very uncommon, unless you are in a population with a degree of consanguinity. Idiopathic growth hormone deficiency, the commonest cause of growth hormone deficiency, structural defects, um, shown here or acquired tumors, craniopharyngioma, et cetera, radiotherapy to the um, central nervous system, and then uh, inflammatory or granulomatous diseases. Now, when you are looking in the whole at growth hormone deficiency, you can divide it up broadly, 70% will have idiopathic growth hormone deficiency. And 30% will have either genetic or organic. Also, you can divide it up into about 70% have a relatively mild deficiency with a peak growth hormone of between three and seven nanograms per mil. About 30% or 20% will have a more severe deficiency uh, with a peak growth hormone of less than three nanograms per mil. And this again is, is very important because the treatment of these two different of these groups, severe and mild, is different. And I'll come on to that. So growth hormone deficiency in its sort of idiopathic form presents either often around the age of five years when children go to primary school or around the age of 10 or 11 when they go to secondary school. Now, this little boy corresponds to your case number one to some extent. He, I saw him at the age of four and he was already very short, minus 3.5 uh, standard deviations below the mean. Uh, he was very immature. He had mid-facial hypoplasia. He had rather small external genitalia. He had quite a lot of subcutaneous fat, and he was growing very slowly. And he had a growth hormone. Um, uh, he and yes, he also had hypothyroidism, um, which we treated before doing a actually an insulin test, which I would not do now in this little boy. I would do a glucagon test. Anyhow, this was a few years ago, 1982, and um, he had a insulin-induced hypoglycemia test, an ITT, and his blood sugar fell to low values here. Despite severe hypoglycemia, he could not increase his cortisol level, which meant that he had ACTH deficiency, and he could not increase his growth hormone level, which meant that he had severe growth hormone deficiency. Now, the reason I'm showing you this little boy is that in 1982, we, um, <clears throat> we had uh, 
the availability of growth hormone releasing hormone, which had just been made available. And we gave him GHRH or GRF, growth hormone releasing factor. And he, he was able to make, to secrete growth hormone from his pituitary. So that told us that his pituitary was functional and the, but the primary defect was actually in the hypothalamus. That doesn't change his management, but it's interesting from an etiological point of view. And here again is a, a child also similar <coughs> to your case number one with um, congenital hypopituitarism, jaundice. The jaundice is actually related to cortisol deficiency, features of hypothyroidism, midfacial hypoplasia, delayed dentition, quite a lot of subcutaneous fat, um, thin, sparse hair, and a very low growth velocity. This is classical hypopituitarism of infancy. And, and not only is growth hormone deficient, but TSH and ACTH are usually um, deficient as well. And here is the classical MRI appearance in the severely affected child. And you get the ectopic uh, posterior pituitary gland, which, which shows up as a bright spot on an MRI. The pituitary stalk, stalk is almost invisible. And there is severe anterior hypoplasia, which I think to some extent uh, fits in with your empty cellar syndrome. If you see this MRI appearance, you need to look carefully for TSH and ACTH deficiency. And I wondered in your case number two, whether there was uh, now evidence of ACTH deficiency. And of course, having diagnosed growth hormone deficiency, whether it's severe or mild, you need to do an MRI scan to look for the cause, which can be something like uh, septo-optic dysplasia, or of course, a craniopharyngioma. So growth hormone deficiency is a broad spectrum condition. You have the extreme cases and you have the mild cases. The extreme cases are rare, the mild cases are much more common. Now, which of these two will respond best to growth hormone? Well, the answer is the little boy on the left. And uh, he um, has undetectable growth hormone and was treated with a relatively small dose of replacement growth hormone therapy and he, he grew 15 centimeters in the first year. Your, your, your typical mild idiopathic growth hormone deficiency patient on the right, he uh, needed twice the dose of growth hormone and had a good response, uh, 9.6 centimeters per year. But it's absolutely clear that the more severe the deficiency, the better the more responsive the child is to growth hormone replacement. So don't forget that <clears throat> when you are investigating short stature, there's a, a lot is being written now about genetic findings. And a lot of the rather um, strong personalities in the genetics field are saying, look, you know, genetics will give you the answer to everything. That is not true. We just wrote this, this review um, and uh, you can find it in the uh, annals in pediatric endocrinology and metabolism. And the point that we tried to make was that you have three branches or three approaches to investigation of short stature. You have the clinical approach, with the history and the physical examination and the, the recognition of phenotypic uh, abnormalities, dysmorphic features. 
you have the biochemical, endocrinological, and ra uh, radiological approach shown here, and you have the genetic approach. And basically the thing is to combine the three. Don't throw out clinical skills in favor of genetic diagnosis. That would be, if you remember one thing from this talk, that would be my message. Do not throw out clinical skills. They are very important. Right, what are the unmet needs related to management of growth hormone deficiency? Well, one is late diagnosis. Um, in Germany, they do quite well. They have their, their patients on treatment by the age of, of, of about five. In the UK, we do much less well, the age of about eight. And in the United States, they do much less well with the, the age of about 10. So late diagnosis is an issue. It's something that it's gonna be difficult for you and me to, to change, but uh, you need to recognize that the earlier the diagnosis, the better the long-term response. Poor response to therapy, uh, I'll come to adherence is an issue which is now becoming much more prominent. And unstructured transitional care is also important. So what are the aims of growth hormone therapy? To induce catch-up growth, to maintain growth within the normal range, and to achieve an adult height close to the target, the genetic target height. These are the aims. We must be aware of adherence as an issue. Um, it is poor adherence is much commoner than we recognized. Growth hormone therapy must be safe. IGF-1 should be within the normal range. Patient-friendly uh, treatment is something that we're always striving for. And as you know, in three or four years time, long acting growth hormone will be, will be with us. I mean, it's gonna be with us next in 2022. Uh, it's already been approved in some countries and that's going to come. Uh, it's not going to answer all the problems, but it will help, uh, I believe, in general. And we need to um, tailor, we need to individualize treatment according to every individual patient. So here is our little boy. We gave him a T4 thyroxine and hydrocortisone when we realized that he had ACTH and TSH deficiency. We started him on growth hormone. He had amazing catch-up growth. You only see this type of catch-up growth when you're treating severe growth hormone deficiency. He grew beautifully. He needed some help with testosterone at puberty. And uh, he reached a, a, a very acceptable adult height. Why? because he was young when we treated him and because he had severe growth hormone deficiency and was highly responsive. Of course, he needs careful, formal transitional care from pediatric to adult endocrine care and the possibility of continuing adult growth hormone therapy. Now, how do children with growth hormone deficiency respond? Well, these are data published in what, 2006, and they really represent treatment during the previous 20 years. Okay, 1985, recombinant growth hormone came on the scene. Uh, and for 20 years, we treated children with growth hormone deficiency in a, in a pretty standard way. And these are their near adult heights. Now, how do you think they did? Well, the mean is, is okay, but look at the range. The range is very, very wide. And many of these children did, did badly. Why is that? Because we're not individualizing treatment for each patient. And this really came to the, 
came in onto the picture when uh, Ranke published his, his prediction model. And this slide shows the prediction factors uh, ranked one to six in different conditions. So here you have idiopathic or isolated growth hormone deficiency. The number one ranking predictor of response is the degree of growth hormone deficiency. The number two factor is age. The number five factor is dose. Dose isn't important here. You give a small amount of growth hormone, they're highly responsive. You then look at Turner's syndrome, SGA, and idiopathic short stature, and you see a different picture. In Turner's syndrome, the number one predictor of response is dose. That's why I made the point before in, in your patient with Turner's syndrome, you must treat with 50 micrograms per kilogram per day. And as Dr. Davis said, this isn't replacement, this is a pharmacological uh, approach to therapy. And the same goes for uh, small for gestational age and also to some extent for idiopathic short stature. And so if you look across the spectrum of conditions that we are now, uh, which are now licensed for growth hormone therapy, you see that growth hormone deficiency can either be treated with a small replacement dose, a sort of medium sized dose, or a, a larger dose, because here you're treating peak growth hormone of 10 micrograms per liter, which many people would say is not growth hormone deficiency, but idiopathic short stature. So this is a, sort of a gray definition, but you have to choose whether to treat small, use small replacement dose, medium size replacement dose, or a, a larger dose. And then in Turner syndrome 50 and um, some very short children with late presentation of small for gestational age need an even higher dose of growth hormone. So long acting growth hormone, one slide. This is going to be uh, approved. It is already approved in a number of countries, Australia, Canada, Japan. Uh, you basically have three different preparations which are gonna be on the market. I mean, maybe in India you have more, I don't know. You have the Ascendis uh, growth hormone, you have the Novo Nordisk growth hormone, and you have the Opco Pfizer growth hormone. And compared with daily growth hormone, the efficacy was excellent in all three. All three during the first year of treatment induced a height velocity uh, greater than with daily growth hormone. 11 compared to 10, 11 compared to nine, 10 compared to nine. So the efficacy is there. This is once weekly growth hormone therapy. So it's coming. We have to learn how to, how to use it, but it's definitely coming. Adherence is a key issue. We cannot any longer ignore adherence <coughs> or poor adherence. And poor adherence is common. Now, hopefully the weekly growth hormone will help that. I don't think it'll solve it completely, but it will help it. So I'm just gonna say it is an important issue. And there is no question that poor adherence is related to poor response. Height velocity standard deviation score was much lower in the children with poor adherence. This is obvious, but we cannot ignore it any longer. And why are children poorly adherent? A lot of this is actually our responsibility. There's no point just blaming the, the, the kids and the families. Sometimes we are giving inadequate education, inadequate contact, poor understanding of diagnosis, and poor training 
in terms of injection technique. So I believe that a lot of this is down to us. If we run a really efficient organization, and for example, things like uh, the same doctor seeing the patient every time they come up, you know, things like this, then we will see better adherence, but we can no longer ignore it. So finally, what about transitional care? This is the little boy, Nicholas, who I showed you uh, who had the mild growth hormone deficiency. <coughs> he has grown beautifully. He's now taller than his brother and the same height as his father. But when he was retested, after he completed his growth, his growth hormone was completely normal. So some of these patients, when you retest them, they have normal growth hormone, the mild cases. They don't need to be seen anymore. You can say goodbye to them. But we have to recognize that there is a difference between the completion of linear growth in height at the age of 17 or 18 in boys and the completion of development, which is muscle bulk and bone mineral density at the age of 25. And if we are treating a child with growth hormone deficiency and they still have growth hormone deficiency, you need to retest them at the age of 18 and they stop growth hormone replacement, they will not reach their normal peak bone mass because growth hormone plays an important part in this. Then they will develop osteopenia and osteoporosis and have an increased risk of fractures uh, in adult life. So we, we looked at this quite carefully and in a selection of 17 to 20 year olds who had completed their growth, but still had growth hormone deficiency, we either discontinued their growth hormone or continued it. The, the patients who continued growth hormone increased their bone mineral content significantly here. The patients who stopped growth hormone had no increase in bone mineral content, <coughs> which meant that they would be at risk of fractures later. We also looked at their body composition. And the patients who stopped growth hormone in green, there was no increase in lean body mass or, or muscle mass. Whereas the ones who continued in blue increased their, their um, lean body mass. And the ones who continued in blue had less accumulation of fat compared to the patients who stopped growth hormone who had increased accumulation of fat. So there is a significant effect on body composition uh, in the, the young adult with severe growth hormone deficiency. This is my last slide in summary. Diagnosis and management of pediatric growth hormone deficiency presents challenges to clinicians, patients, and families. Early diagnosis, uh, is critical for improving the outcome, but diagnostic delays are common. <coughs> daily treatment with growth hormone therapy daily presents a burden, physical, emotional, and quality of life changes, challenges. The, the late initiation and poor adherence affects treatment outcomes, as you saw, and transitional care and adult growth hormone therapy must be recognized. The arrival of long-acting growth hormone therapy is going to improve outcome, but unmet current clinical needs are still important. So I'll try to give you an overview. I know there's been a lot to take in, but I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.
Yeah, thank you, Dr. Martin. It was a wonderful session, and you know, great going through the whole of understanding of both of. I think we are going. We'll take quickly take two three questions. Is it okay, Dr. Martin? Is it okay we send with two questions? Yeah, yeah, of course. So, uh, one of those, Dr. Vanan asked, them, "What are the treatment recommendations for children with GH1 gene deletion with no response to growth hormone therapy?" Okay, <clears throat> sorry. Okay, GH1 gene deletion. In some patients, uh, when you treat with growth hormone, you get anti-growth hormone antibodies, and uh, that causes a form of growth hormone resistance. That, that is treatable with recombinant IGF-1, okay? Um, is that a simple answer? Okay, so no, what he's saying that if it is not going to respond to growth hormone, then what do we do? You have to, you have to, uh, you have to treat with IGF-1. Okay. Yeah. It's, the, it's the only way of, uh, because essentially, <clears throat> they have antibodies uh, which neutralize the effect of um, exogenous growth hormone and um, growth hormone therapy cannot be effective. So, so they have a form of growth hormone resistance which is treatable with recombinant IGF-1 therapy. Is there, you know, there's another question there because we are talking a lot this coming of this long growth hormone therapy, you know, treatment once a week. So are there any concerns with the side effects of using long-acting growth, growth hormone than daily growth? Because there'll be very high peak levels of IGF-1 will persist still in the body. So are there any concerns or I mean, is there any? Okay. Okay. Well, you're absolutely right to ask this question. Okay. Efficacy is good. Safety in terms of um, antibodies, anti- antibodies to the to, to the, the long-acting growth hormone is probably going to be all right. I mean, I've seen eight to nine year data, you know, with one of the preparations, and there was no effect of antibodies. They do develop antibodies, but there was no effect of antibodies on, on growth or on IGF-1. IGF-1, you are correct, is generally higher in these in with weekly treatment than it is with daily treatment. So there has you're going to have to measure IGF-1, and there have to be guidelines produced by the companies to to check the level of IGF-1. It doesn't go very high. But it's used often, it's between two and three or two and 2.5 standard deviations above the mean. I think we just have to see how, how this plays out. But, the, but we, we are need, going to need to think about IGF-1. A metabolic effect on insulin, growth, uh, glucose seem not to be important. So I would say, um, uh, and the other, the other issue is pain at the site of injections. We're going to have just to see how, how, that, how that works out. But I think carefully managed, I think it's going to be a, a major advance. There's one more question, you know, because there, the Growth Hormone Research Society you know, is mentioning that SDA SDA scores, for especially for Turner and SGA, you can take, go up to three standard deviation. It doesn't make a difference for IGF-1. So what is your take on this? Um, now, I, I think you're going to have to find a laboratory which, which will give you an IGF-1 level in, in standard deviations, or else a very a carefully an accurately calculated normal range. There has to be some way of assessing the level of IGF-1, um, you know, compared to, to the normal range, either standard deviations or, or, or um, <clears throat> you know, cent a centile level. So I think, uh, I, I think this, you know, this is something which we're going to have to come to 
an agreement on how to how to actually assess IGF-1 uh, in long-acting growth hormone therapy. <clears throat> so there's one more question: minimum age for doing growth hormone stimulation test. Well, I don't I don't think that you in in an infant who you think may have hypopituitarism, I would not recommend a growth hormone stimulation test. I would say something like the age of two, but also, you know, if you use a, a glucagon test in a two-year-old, you have to be very careful uh, because it's possible to induce severe hypoglycemia even with a glucagon test. So the doctor has to be there the whole time. You have to have venous access, et cetera. You have to be very careful. I would say the age of something like two. <clears throat> it is another, in a child with growth hormone deficiency with the residue of an operated craniofrenoma, can we give growth hormone in such children? Sorry, I didn't catch that. So, so there's a child who's been had an operated craniofrenoma. A craniofrenoma, yeah. yeah. So, and we have, uh, you know, we have evidence of growth hormone deficiency by the stimulation, but there is still residue of craniofrenoma there. So can we give growth hormone in these patients? Yes, I think so. Yes, yes. I, I don't think there is any evidence that growth hormone therapy will stimulate the growth of the, of the craniofrenoma. Okay. So there's one more. One, what level of growth hormone should you take as normal after re retesting at completion? So a child has finished growth hormone therapy, going in the okay. pregnancy. <clears throat> so what level? What are the level? And what age will you retest for growth hormones at the end of the treatment? Okay. Well, you the age when you retest is when the child has completed growth and then basically you take them off growth hormone therapy for maybe three months and you do uh, either an insulin or a, a glucagon test don't use clonidine at that point because you need to to stimulate the hypothalamic pituitary axis um, what is the level? It's, it's debatable. I would say something like five or six uh, micrograms per litre. There, there, there's literature on this, and um, I would say if it's less than five, then the child or the, the adolescent has growth hormone deficiency and needs to be followed, needs to be followed. <coughs> So, uh, Martin, you know, in U in UK, they do glucagon, they do all these tests. So, in India, the most common test which is being done is clonidine. So, can we compare it to glucagon or to, you know, insulin or GRH, you know, stimulation or arginine? Can we compare it? Because most of the time, we're doing a single, uh, uh, you know, uh, here, a clonidine test and then doing oxology on the basis of oxology and we start growth yeah. I think it's I think it's fine in children. But I think in I think in in the young adult they they need more stimulation. I, I I would recommend either an insulin test or or a glucagon test. And it's a question of linking with an adult endocrinologist <clears throat> who is going to eventually take over the care of the patient. This is tra this is transitional care, which is very difficult, and in some parts of the world doesn't exist. Yeah, it's a big, a, a big challenge. Yeah, that's a very big challenge. So, uh, is there any other question, Hari? I don't find any other questions. Is there any other questions? Yeah, only a small question. What dose do we give for adult growth hormone deficiency? Well, <laughs> yeah, okay. I'm a pediatrician. I think what they do is they start with a low dose and then they, tr they titrate the dose according to the IGF-1 level. But there are guide there are guidelines on this, but I, I I can't give you specific reference for that to be honest. But the dose required is is lower than in pediatrics. I think it's on 0.2 milligrams per day to start and then gradually gradually build it up on the IGF one levels. Okay. Okay. I, I have one question, Dr. Martin. Uh, so yeah. we do sex steroid priming in uh, children uh, of both gender, like boys and girls at 10 years of age, or like we should do it a little earlier in girls? Sorry, okay. I, I heard that you, you do it. Uh, 
uh, the question is uh, when we do sex steroid priming yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, prior to growth hormone stimulation test, uh, <laughs> you have mentioned like about 10 years of age in both the genders or like we do it a little earlier in girls. You do it earlier in girls. So about uh, so eight, eight, nine years, we do it like what is so the, the question is what age should you do in girls and what age should you yeah. do in girls? Yeah, that's, okay, that's, okay. It's uh, simplified, you know. Yeah, I mean, probably age 10 in girls and age 11 in boys, something like that. Something like that, depending on the, on the, you know, if, if they're, if they're just, just before puberty and in early puberty, that's the time to, to use sex steroid priming. So, you know, uh, Martin, in our case, second case, you know, the bone age was only uh, six years and the chronological yeah. age was 11 years. So, will you ever ever get CDGP with such gross difference in bone age with the, you know, the chronological age? Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I mean, that patient had hypothyroidism. Um, hormone deficiency. Yeah. Severe growth hormone deficiency. Yeah. I mean, you, you, Yes. I mean, but that, that little boy should do very well in terms of response to, to, to treatment. But watch out for his ACTH. Well, no, watch ACTH out. It is normal. You know, till now that we have done it, it's all normal. It's come out. We yeah, always but, suspected yeah. cortisol may be deficient, but cortisol levels are coming normal. He's, he, but he's likely to develop ACTH yeah. deficiency. Yeah, very, very interesting case. So uh, I think Dr. Shaila, that we have finished with the questions. I'll give it back to Dr. Shaila to take over. Thank you very much, uh, Doctor. You can okay. I am unmuted. Okay. Thank you very much, Doctor Savaj. It was an excellent uh, lecture. You're um, welcome. Uh, I think you did specify that clinical examination is more important than going on for genetic testing. Thank you very much for reinforcing that message. In okay. this group. <laughs> okay, you're welcome. Because uh, people jump into genetic tests before doing anything or thinking anything now. <laughs> so I think uh, you did emphasize on the clinical examination. It, it was an excellent uh, uh, message for uh, everyone here. We don't okay. get, uh, we, uh, IGF-1 is not available in our country as of now. Oxandrolone is available in few uh, places only. Yeah. And um, the long acting we did use uh, uh, did trials and started using the weekly ones uh, LG one, but a uh, lot of side effects with that, so it has not come into market. And fourthly, we have done few trials on uh, Oppo long acting. We are just waiting, but we have had good response, and a few patients uh, who were uh, on that have really done uh, well with the Oppo long acting uh, growth hormone. Okay. So this is from our side, um, from India. Uh, otherwise, we do get um, um, uh, both the biosimilar and recombinant uh, growth hormone here. So we are all uh, using it. But again, with the scare of uh, ITT, we are, most of us are uh, doing clonidine and few of us do That's add. Right. That's okay. That's yeah, good. Oxology and clonidine. Then few places we do glucagon. Otherwise... Um, once they are above 18, uh, we do transfer to adult uh, endocrinologist. Um, yes, 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 yes. So okay. this is uh, growth hormone and deficiency from our side. Okay. In, thank Are you very much. Uh, it was a great pleasure having you and Dr. Davis here. Thank you. Uh, it was an excellent uh, discussion both from, by you and a lot of questions from the delegates. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. You're very welcome. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. I hope to see you again. Sure, I think we should meet physically next. <laughs> okay. Hope to see you in India. Yeah. Yes, sir. Thank sure. you, Dr. Martin. Thank you, Shaila, and everyone for this. Yeah, uh, Dr. Hari. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, uh, on behalf of ISPE, uh, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Davis and Professor Martin Savage for uh, giving insight uh, uh, in, and they're sharing their knowledge about uh, Turner syndrome as well as growth hormone deficiency. I would like to uh, thank my presenters uh, today, Reshma and uh, Suraksha, as well as their moderators, Dr. Kavita Bhatt and Dr. IPS Kocher, for, uh, uh, for the wonderful case presentation and discussion. 
uh, I thank all my uh, all the attendees who have taken out time on Saturday evening and uh, uh, had been with us. Uh, I would like to thank Divya uh, for her uh, moderation and continuous support in arranging this uh, uh, session. Uh, finally, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Shaila, Madam uh, uh, President, SPA 2021-22 for uh, all the all her efforts uh, support uh, brainstorming and planning it and and her guidance uh, finally i would like to thank uh, uh, stuti and, uh, and rx events for the technical support uh, i, I uh, um, thank you all for uh, uh, attending this and making it a successful event so we now uh, leave the meeting also i think Thank you so much, Davis. Thank you, Dr. Davis, and thank you, Dr. Martin. Thank you. Bye-bye. Lecture by both.